This episode is brought to you by Avalanche and Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Enjoy. If you look at other pools of wealth, um, there's immense pools of wealth that also have been waiting for a traditional market vehicle. Wait till Bitcoin goes on like a, like a nice one month run where it's just crushing. I think a lot of their clients are like, hey, where's my crypto? The, the younger clients and even the older ones now want something crypto and the ETF is their preferred wrapper. All right, folks, we are doing a whole deep dive on the Bitcoin ETF today. I am joined by my colleague, Casey Wagner, reporter at BlockWorks, also Eric Balkunis, senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg, and Leah Wald from Valkyrie. Welcome to Empire, everybody. Thank you for having me, Jason. It's a real pleasure to be on with you, Eric, and nice to meet you. And Casey, thank you as well. I'll just, I'll just say, uh, I will repeat everything she just said and just leave it there. I agree. It's uh, great to meet you. And uh, and see you guys somewhat in person. Perfect, perfect. Eric, I thought um I thought maybe you could actually set the context for us um and go pre crypto. Uh, one of one of our the BlockWorks advisors is this guy Matt Hogan, who uh pretty he re- he used to run ETFs.com, and he was telling us this crazy story about how uh, ETFs you know back in the day when ETFs were just kicking off they were pretty frowned upon like. The people creating ETFs would go in front of Congress. And what that reminds me of is crypto today, right? Going in front of Congress, telling them why crypto is real, you know, in the same way that we would say why ETFs are real. So can you kind of just paint the picture and give us like a, what, what, what are the comparisons between ETFs and crypto? And like, what did it used to look like? And how did we get here with ETFs? Yeah, no, there's a lot of connections. I have really uh, learned from interacting with the crypto world and seeing it, you know, like I said, it, it irks certain people. Uh, I don't think the, the establishment isn't very comfortable with it. And ETFs the same way. They are a disruptive force. I've always equated ETFs to the MP3, frankly, because unlike crypto, which is an asset class, ETFs are, some, are, are simply a delivery mechanism. And if, you've, if you're old like me and you remember buying CDs, you'd spend like 200 bucks a month or every two months, and half the songs were awful. Um, maybe an album here and there was really good, but largely you paid a lot of money, 16 bucks for a CD. Um, and then the MP3 came along, and voila, I've spent a lot less money on music. Um, it's more flexible. Um, I can share it. And so the MP3, to me, like was like four evolutionary steps from the CD. And I think that's the ETF to the mutual fund. That said, the mutual fund still has some, some case uses or some use cases, but um, that's the ETF. Also, the ETF is very competitive with costs. And I think right now we're in an era where people just want everything pretty cheap. Um, and so ETF industry, unlike the rest of Wall Street, for the most part, really lives on scraps. I call it the terror dome. It's a very tough place. You've got the likes of BlackRock and Vanguard to compete with. There's a lot of innovation here. I also uh, refer to it as the Silicon Valley of the investing world. And so I agree. There's just I was attracted to the ETF space simply because it seemed like a lot of people who were not really that, who were a little outsider-ish from the rest of asset management, there's a lot of indie spirit in the ETF world. There's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of fun. I mean, the crypto world, what's the dog, the latest dog coin that's like worth a billion dollars or whatever? Um, you know, that reminds me of like when the uh, whiskey ETF came out or something. People are like, oh, you know, some people are like, this is ridiculous, you know, clutching their pearls. And other people just kind of roll with it. And there's a lot of similarities, I think, between the two worlds in some of those ways. So I do agree with Matt Hogan, who I know very well. He's one of about eight people who has gone from the ETF to the crypto world. And the people who have gone from ETF to crypto world have all stayed there. So that must speak a lot about what they see there and how they like it. So, um, and I expect more, more to happen. But who knows? Maybe the crypto person might go ETF one of these days. We'll see. Uh, Eric, I heard you say on a podcast, I forget who it was with, but ETFs are a superior wrapper for pretty much every single investable asset class. Can you just uh, explain why? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, an ETF, uh, the, the big three are they're, they're usually pretty inexpensive. They're liquid. You, know, you can trade them intraday. Um, Bitto already trades at a, at a one basis point spread. I mean, compare that to any exchange. That's, gonna be, that's probably going to beat every exchange. That people love that. And they love going in, not being seen. It's anonymous. Nobody knows who's trading what, you know. So uh, that's one. And then a less... Appreciated reason, I think, for crypto people is they're tax efficient. You only get capital gains distribution when you sell, or like you only get taxed when you sell. Mutual funds kick out capital gains distributions if somebody else sells. And so people just find that annoying. 
I don't blame mutual funds. They're kind of like, it's an unfair advantage for ETFs there. But largely, it's those things and also just the idea that you can short an ETF. There's options on an ETF. Um, they're just very much like a Swiss army knife. You might ask an institution what they like about an ETF. They're going to say liquidity and the options. You ask an advisor, they're going to say they're cheap and they're tax efficient. Um, and so there's a lot of different, like a Swiss army knife, I might use two or three. There's probably about 12 advantages and the different ones will be important to different people. And it's, inter it's a fascinating, it's the first time you have people like my mom in the same fund as the world's largest hedge fund which is uh, like VWO. My mom does own that ETF, and so does Bridgewater. And that's crazy. I mean, that would never happen before. And so uh, that is, I think, why they're interesting, fascinating, and growing so quickly. A lot of people make the comparison between the Bitcoin ETF and, and the, the gold ETF. But I think one of the fallacies of that is that you couldn't really access gold before the gold ETF came out, whereas right now you can access Bitcoin on things like Coinbase or whatever it may be. Why... Why, did, why are you guys tackling the Bitcoin ETF? Like, why did you guys see this as a problem? Unfortunately, in Bitcoin, the service providers are just so expensive that the arena right now, it's a little difficult. I think you were right, though, as more institutional players, whether it's, you know, BNY, Mellon or State Street or whoever, you know, shows up in the future doing custody and other aspects, fund admin, et cetera, get more comfortable with the industry, then I think that, you know, that will be able to create an environment where fees will continue to drop and we'll see some of that competition that we see in the traditional space. But it, it's definitely an interesting, still Wild West environment where the rest of the ecosystem is quite expensive. Um, and when I think about gold, I think about um, the history of getting comfortable with custody. And that obviously brings up, you know, a lot of um, I think issues that the SEC has seen with our industry in approving spot, you know, is just trying to get comfortable with what does it mean for custody. Um, and I think that's some of the battle. Um, and I think that, you know, there's at least good history to show that the comfortability comes. Um, and I think you're right about, you know, mixed baskets that's always desired by advisors. Um, and I think that that will come as well. <laughs> yeah, and you're, you're, you're right about the point. And this is something that was brought up in a court, a court's article. Crypto has definitely rocked the ETF world. There's no doubt. Everybody's gone gaga in my neck of the woods. But watch ETFs kind of mess with crypto a little bit. Uh, some of these exchanges, when I look at these fees, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You would, never, that, that, you would never survive in the ETF world with that. So I think, to your point, I think, um, Leah, some of the ETF people who are used to working at lower rates, they're going to come in saying, look, we have access to a lot of potential cash. Like, can you give us a better rate. And I think the ETFs will ultimately pressure some of the crypto world, which makes some of these, there's a lot of money being made right now. I think there'll be some compression there. So I do think that ETFs will have their own sort of like, I don't know if the word, uh, if the word, you know, I guess not disruption, but like effect on the crypto environment as well. I think to your point, Eric, and I'm curious as to your thoughts, because you are definitely the, the ETF expert on the call here or the podcast here. What's interesting to me about the current custodial solutions is, again, the, the granular minutia of how ETFs are traded with creation and redemptions is very specific and is necessary to be very uh, quick, efficient, and uh, happen uh, very simultaneously. So, um, you know, I think it'll be interesting when you're talking about these traditional market players potentially entering the system who are familiar with the creates and redemption of ETFs and those mechanics, working with APs, et cetera, and the market participants, um, that they will bring that know-how to what's needed for custodians and other players uh, to therefore create you know, an ecosystem that's, again, more aligned with what is needed for the ETFs. Do you see any issues right now with the market and the current service providers and being able to facilitate, let's just say, the creation redemption um, system that's needed in, in ETFs right now. Obviously, it's working well in Canada, but in, in the U.S., do you see any challenges? There, you can always do cash creates, but it's not ideal. Uh, that's one option the SEC could go with is cash creates, but I think you like to do in-kind. One of the reasons people like the ETF and it's so popular also is that you can ARB it. So like what Leah's talking about is like if I want to create uh, new shares of GLD. I'm a market maker and like people are asking me for GLD right and left. I'm like, okay, I'll sell you GLD. Well, I've got to go get new GLD because now I'm out of stock. So I have to hand in bars of gold 
and then I get GLD. And see, no cash exchanged hands, so there's no tax there. That's the key tax efficiency. It's pl boring plumbing, but that matters. But that's called in-kind, and so most ETFs are in-kind. I don't know enough about, to be honest, about the inner workings of every single exchange and how that would work. And I don't think every AP is bought into this fully either. So I think it's going to take some time to get the bigger fund companies and the SEC comfortable with that aspect. I think that that is part of why Gensler did not want to approve spot, whereas futures are all completely regulated and they live in this like little mini world, right? Even though you have to arb the futures to the spot world, that's not Gensler's problem. But there are people who are arb that. But I, I think to your point, Leah, when you think of the ETF, it's like a, it's like a tip of an iceberg. It's very easy. It's like, oh, there it is. It's, how easy is that? But underneath, there's a lot of plumbing that involves Wall Street banks, Stodians, um, you know, a lot of service providers, and a lot of big names. So once an ETF is born, it really does kick in this, this whole underworld. And the more people decide to compete for business of these new ETFs launching, I think that will help. But I would get your take on whether you think, let's say a spot ETF launched today and they approved three at once, and they got, say, $10 billion in flows in a month. In your opinion, could they handle arbitrage, creation, redemption without any massive premiums or discounts? It's a great question. Um, I feel like the industry would very quickly try to put something together overnight to make sure it works. Um, I feel like there's a lot of very smart thinkers. Um, you know, but that is a very serious issue. And, you know, a lot of exchanges do go down in the crypto industry with um, huge drawbacks. We've seen that a lot. We've seen, um, you know, complete, uh, complete shutdowns of exchanges and not too unrecently, uh, not a real word, but definitely recently. Um, so that's, that's a good question. I would like to believe that we're ready, but 10 billion is quite a lot. And I think that, you know, we're still growing into some of those capacities to your point of the plumbing. Um, you're absolutely right. And the ecosystem needed to really not only run a successful ETF, but get it off the ground and make healthy markets um, is very is 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 very interesting, is very dedicated and requires a lot of participants. Um, keeping healthy markets, growing healthy markets, keeping spreads, you know, tight. Um, it's all very specific, and I feel like our industry could pull things together very quickly, and I think that we can figure it out for sure. And we definitely do have precedent, not just in Canada, but, you know, there's been ETPs, to your point, not just 21 shares, but, you know, I believe Sweden was maybe the first one approved, but, you know, across a lot of different exchanges at this point, um, you know, not just ETFs, but various ETP structures. So we definitely can. I do think that we have um, some work to do in the U.S., um, but I think that a lot of players are looking into it, thinking about it and already figuring it out, knowing that the futures have been approved and spot is hopefully around the corner, but definitely on Gensler's plate, Chairman Gensler's plate. So, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch. We're definitely intimately involved with some of these conversations. And I think that um, I think you're right that the ETF world is growing on the crypto world. I do think Gensler should give more trust to the industry. They have a good track record of what you said, figuring it out. And if there's money coming in, people are going to get going. I mean, that, that's really go If you $10 billion flowing in in a month, people are going to be like, okay, we need to do something here. And these are massive money centers. One good thing is Fidelity filing for a 33X spot ETF and then going to the SEC and making 11th hour pitch that they should not do the futures and do spot. And that's Fidelity. I thought that was one of those pivotal moments where it's like, wow, this isn't just, I'm not going to say little guy anymore. I'm going to say <laughs> indies, the indies, indie rockers. How about that? This isn't just, <laughs> I love it. I, I honestly, I do call them the indies. I love the you're, indies. Leo, you're, you're like the Williamsburg of, of ETFs here. You are. <laughs> <laughs> to your point, if there's going to be 10 billion in inflows, everybody's going to scramble to make sure that everything's ready. You know, we have both the 40 Act that was approved for futures, but we also have a 33 Act futures filed and spot. So, um, you know, definitely as signals became more apparent, uh, we're all trying to read tea leaves here, but uh, I do think that there's always a little bit of lead time. And as you very well know, just because you're approved um, doesn't mean you're effective. You know, there is still a little bit of lead time before you trade. 
And then also, you know, as you're responding to comments from the SEC and you're engaging with the staff, um, you're learning as well. So I think that we will have enough time that the industry will be ready when that time comes. I guess there's one other question, which is obviously your futures ETF are under the 40 Act, which is a little more robust and painful in the regulation. And there's all kinds of, quote, protections, which Gensler loves. Do you think that he can ever get comfortable with the 33 Act? Or do you think that it's really the, the Bitcoin market itself that needs to be comforting for him to then trust the, the 33 Act's lack of protections? Wow, what a good question. Um, from my perspective as an asset manager, you know, we are excited. We're excited that we're able to be approved for the 40 Act, but we're, you know, very much excited by the efficiency of the 33 Act because you're right. It is more robust with the 40 Act, but it requires um, plumbing, having a Cayman sub, et cetera. Um, I think you're right, though, and I understand your greater question is that I do believe that the crypto industry does need to engage with D.C. a little bit more. I think we're starting to, I think, uh, you know, there's great research hubs, there's Blockworks Group. Um, we're definitely engaging on a few levels, but I think that there's more that we could be doing with DC to get them more comfortable with SPOT um, and to help them better understand some of the granularity of around these SPOT ETFs, which are 33 Act, of course. So S1 filings. Um, so I think we could probably always do more, right? Um, but you're, you're right. Uh, that's a, that's a very good question. That's the question that, like, I hear Grayscale out saying, oh, we're going to convert, but everybody needs to answer what would make Gensler comfortable with the 33 Act. And I'm yet to hear, right. and he was on uh, Yahoo News the other day, and he said, um, he said the crypto exchanges are a bit of the Wild West still. So I don't know what has to happen for them to be, like, settled and, and not Wild West. Uh, but that also would need to happen, it seems like. just seems like, I don't know, maybe... It would it take like a year, maybe some kind of a some kind of a regulation. I don't know what it would be. Something to help the exchanges, something to a framework just to make him feel comfortable. But perhaps time will just handle it. I don't know. But to your point about exchanges, about custody, about security, about you know, these are all other market participants um, that would create that underplumbing that were plumbing that we were talking about with the ETF ecosystem were this to come into play. So the question is you know, uh, are the exchanges also speaking to DC? Are the custodians also speaking to DC? Are the liquidity providers, are the rest of those market participants? And could they be speaking more in a unified language about the benefits of the 33 Act and spot, not just spot, because that that definitely gets the limelight of, you know, we, we love Bitcoin and I most definitely do as well. But you're right. The market structure is uh, the vehicle wrapper is very important to Chairman Gensler. Um, so maybe we could have more unified language together as an ecosystem, especially the other participants on why that 33 Act is the holy grail or that we see it that way. Is there a crypto exchange consortium or <laughs> like lobbying group? I, I'm guessing no, given your answer. But yeah, I agree that. You know, ETFs have the ICI. Yeah, I think that the industry as a whole is pretty much on the same page that there needs to be more done in terms of engaging with Washington, just like Leah said. I think that, you know, crypto does not always get the best reputation um, in Washington. But I also think that, you know, different exchanges, different issuers, different asset managers, everyone has really different goals when it comes to regulation. I know Coinbase released their regulatory framework not everyone agrees with it. Um, there's a few regulatory DAOs that are in the works now. There's a couple lobbying groups that are going to fund candidates and current lawmakers um, that have interest in advancing crypto. But like I said, I think that the only thing that the industry can agree on is that there needs to be more work done. Where that work is done, we'll, we'll have to see. Listen, the key is just give them money and take them out for like steak dinners and drinks and <laughs> <No>. stuff. <laughs> No, that's not crypto style. Take them, you got to take them Steaks golfing. No. no, that's <laughs> golfing. No, golfing. We're not. Let's, come on, lamo. Yeah, golf and steak dinners triggers triggers pro shares in my mind. Like pro shares has a whole 
sales team and they, you know, they, they, they take them out and they go <laughs> golfing and they take them to steak dinners. Listen, if you, if you crypto want to reach them, if you want to reach the motherland of assets, you're going to have to do golfing and steak dinners for some advisors are, are RIAs. They're going to buy it. They're, they don't, they don't not into that. A lot of RAs have evolved out of that whole golfing steak dinner <laughs> thing, but a lot still like to like, communicate that way. Get your golf game up, Leah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, listen, this is this is the this is the boomer way, okay? This is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The exactly. boomers control all the money, so you can't like totally ignore that. Yeah, lean into the stake in the golf. But Leah, like on a on a more serious note, like how do you when you think about all all of these ETFs coming to market, they're all you know, from a from a layman like me, they all they're all pretty similar, right? They're all just kind of a wrapper on Bitcoin and like, you know, how do you compete with the folks like the Wisdom Trees or I know Invesco filed or these, it, it, you know, it's amazing seeing you guys up there. It's like Invesco and Wisdom Tree and Van Eck. And then it's like, you know, uh, the Williamsburg of ETFs. Yeah, the Valkyrie out here. And so how, like, how do you think about. Uh, Getting paid up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you think about the, the race for, for your Bitcoin ETF liquidity? And how do you how do you do that? I have an add on to that being the second mover as a small issuer is pretty impressive. But how do you think about that? Where do you see yourself fitting in? You know, you launched three days after pro shares. What was that process like? Um, I do think there's a market for a lot of issuers, both in the futures and definitely for spot. Um, I think that it'll be interesting how the commission and Gensler decides to approve and when he approves um, and they approve um, the various issuers, since there are so many for spot. In regards to your question, Casey, um, you know, how do we feel about being second mover? It's very difficult. Eric can definitely attest to the history of being a second mover uh, in the ETF industry. Um, definitely. And you're right. We have a very similar product in regards to its fee structure, et cetera. You know, there will come a point to Eric's previous point where we'll all be competing for fees. And I think we'll see that a lot on the spot. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for the futures, although, you know, it's it's Van Eck has already announced lower fees than ProShares and us. Even with futures, even with the limits that some people are concerned about with the CME, I think that there's a lot of room in this market for multiple issuers. I think that also the market does see the big difference between us and ProShares. I'm not going to make fun of golf and stakes, but I would say that, you know, I, I, I definitely am we're wearing Bitcoin t-shirts. Um, I think that at least right now, there's definitely a stark difference between us two issuers. Um, behind us, there's brilliant issuers who definitely are very savvy in crypto. You know, big fans of Vanek, uh, big fans of ARK, big fans of, you know, a lot of a lot of different issuers that would be coming in. And I think then it'll be um, maybe more focused on how our trading is going. And we've been able to keep a penny uh, a penny spread. That's it. The focus right now, I believe, is potentially the size and the differences in who we are as asset managers. I think in the future, as months roll on and advisors start very seriously looking at, um, you know, how are we going to allocate to Bitcoin futures ETF? I think they're going to start looking at who's performing the best. Um, how was their trading? You know, we're still on the October um, and pro shares is now November. Uh, and also I believe looking into December, so there's some serious, you know, limits there. So I, I would just say that I think there's room and I think the products themselves will also start to diverge on how the trading is done. Jason, I think that there's liquidity. I think that the futures do create a, uh, you know, a more unique environment with the limits, although limits are increased in November. Um, but I do think with spot, there will be enough liquidity, but I do also think that's with market participants, you know, getting prepared, maybe, you know, utilizing multiple exchanges, utilizing multiple custodians, setting themselves up for, uh, ensuring that that liquidity is there. But, um, Eric, I'm, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts, since you can speak more than I can right now on this call about it, but are you concerned about the role and the position of, you know, you can say about us as well, um, but issuers in the market and needing to go out to December or if it will overrun the futures market. I mean, that's obviously a big question that we're often asked. Can you just explain that for, for the little brain like me who doesn't understand why this would like what it means to overrun the futures market? Like, in other words, you take up you, you own too much of it. 
that's why they have limits because they, they don't want somebody cornering the market and controlling the futures. This was goes back to like I think the '80s when people would try to corner the like corn market. You ever see trading places? It's like that kind of commodities thing. Your bellies and orange juice. The way to think about futures is like there's months, right? The more optimistic people are on Bitcoin, the, the more it'll, it'll go up, right? Because they're like, well, time and bullishness will equal a higher price in three months, right? So that's why if you own November, you could be close to spot. But when you have to roll, you'll probably pay a little more, right? You'll have to pay up a little bit. So that's called roll cost. Now, what Lee is talking about is that ProShares own so much of October because they were so successful, they hit a limit because of the trading places situation. <laughs> So they have to go into the November, and now they own half and half pretty much November and October. The problem with that is now you're losing sensitivity to spot Bitcoin. And so for the trading crowd in particular, I think Leah's case against ProShares is probably going to be effective. That normally doesn't exist in, an, in a second to market. You have a lucky extra sales point there. And by the way, um, I heard so, there was an article that said, oh, Valkyrie's launch was disappointing. It traded $78 million. That makes it the 15th most successful launch ever. Thank you. That's insane <laughs> to call that disappointing. It's only disappointing because the one that came before it was like such a blockbuster smash. But that's how much there's probably going to be available for the third one and the fourth one. And all these people know people. They have audiences that they can go to uh, in pro shares, it, depending on the how mainstream versus indie. I think the indie players might help get the crypto street cred going, but the main ones, the bigger guys, they're going to be able to utilize their wholesalers who have real relationships with the boomers. And that's where the big money is. So I do see that the bigger the issuer, they'll probably dominate, but I see the indies as all carving out good niches. So we have this projection of assets and we have everybody basically over $100 million dollars come two, two, three years from now. I don't know if anybody on that list is like what could possibly fail. I mean, Kathy Wood, ARC alone is probably going to be able to move 350 right into the fund from the GBTC exposure she has in ARC W. I know Bitwise and Matt Hogan, they are very locked into current clients and advisors. They'll probably be able to get their own assets. Valkyrie is lucky that they at least are second because they're probably going to have volume that's decent. And that's the thing. Assets can be gotten fairly easy. Volume almost has to happen in nature naturally, like a special flower. You cannot like just make it appear. It grows organically, but then once it grows, you can it's hard to steal it. Being first, second, third is crucial for volume. Assets, I think, will be spread around a little more. Thank you, Eric. And maybe a nuance that the you know some listeners don't follow that Eric is pointing out, which is very important, is keeping a healthy market. Um, and that's necessary with volume. And even if you're, you know, getting as many redemptions as you are creates during the day, you're at least keeping a healthy market in your ETF and it is an ecosystem. Um, something that, you know, I'm, I've been grappling with that I, I'd be curious your thoughts, Eric, Jason and Casey. Um, you know, I do come from the RIA world and my former partner, Tyler Jenks, uh, was quite conservative when it comes to, uh, you know, our fiduciary duties, whereas he was very aggressive in our personal portfolios and we had fun. Uh, you know, he did manage a lot of pensions. Um, I was thinking about his money management style a few days ago, and he would have definitely waited, I think, until about Q1 to see how these products perform before jumping in. I think he would have been, you know, very acutely watching, uh, trying to decipher again, um, you know, how large is the spread? How are they hitting the limits? Um, how is it tracking Bitcoin? And then um, starting to make very active plays, probably Q1. Now, a lot of people um, have been giving us comments about how um, either too little demand, too much demand coming into Bitcoin right now. Bitcoin is slumping. Um, you know, is this it? Is this all? Um, but I think that large pools of wealth are still waiting on the sidelines and they're, you know, very much watching to see how these go. They do need to go by investment committee at these larger firms. It's not overnight. Not everybody jumps into IPOs or or when things are originally listed. But, you know, I'd, I'd be curious all three of your thoughts on that. Empire is proud to be supported by Avalanche, 
there is a layer one war heating up in crypto and Avalanche is at the center of it. Avalanche is one of the fastest smart contract platforms in the industry. I've been looking into the ecosystem recently and I'm honestly amazed by how fast it's growing. Here are three reasons why I'm so intrigued by Avalanche. Number one, Curve and Aave, two of the biggest DeFi protocols are in testing right now for Avalanche integrations. Number two, new projects. These are not just NFT clones, AMM knockoffs, and lending protocols. These are new projects, NFT projects, play to earn games, really, really interesting stuff happening in the Avalanche ecosystem. And number three, Binance just re-enabled C-Chain integration. What in the world does this mean? This means that you, the user, can directly withdraw to your MetaMask, which previously was a pretty big user bottleneck. Thank you, Avalanche for sponsoring Empire. We are going to continue to explore Avalanche in future episodes. Hope you enjoy it. I would recommend that you do the same. Empire is proud to be supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is one of the leading DEX aggregators in crypto. Let's say you're booking a flight. You would never go directly to an airline, right? You'd never go directly to United or Delta. You'd obviously go to Google Flights or Expedia or Kayak or Booking.com. That's what Paraswap does for DeFi. Paraswap, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see the platform. Paraswap makes swapping easier, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper by aggregating more than 80 different DEXs. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, Uniswap, Sushi, Balancer, uh, Bancor into one single interface. You can use Paraswap on ETH, Polygon, as you can see here, BSC, they recently launched Avalanche a few weeks ago, pretty exciting. If you are a trader listening to this, you are losing money by not using Paraswap. And excitingly enough, if you're a company or a platform looking to access the swapping or the yield capabilities of DEXs, you can now use Paraswap's APIs to integrate into your platform to get the full power of the DEX aggregator into your platform. So head on over to paraswap.io. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how simple it is to use. Just plug in, let's say I wanna swap you know, 0.2 ETH, for USDT, you can see how simple it is. Just plug that in right there and it aggregates over 80 different DEXs. So head on over to Paraswap, P-A-R-A-S-W-A-P dot I-O to use the platform today. All right, let's get back to the show. First off, only in crypto can you say that Bitcoin is slumping when it's up. Uh, yeah. it, it, this time last year, it was at $13,000. So right. this is $61,000 right, right, right. today. So only in crypto. Right. <laughs> Wait till Bitcoin goes on like a, like a nice one month run where it's just crushing, what you're going to find is that that'll get it people's interest. The other thing with the advisor question you had is I think a lot of them are, yes, they want to be fiduciary and wait, but they're, they're, they're feeling pressure. I think a lot of their clients are like, hey, where's my crypto? I, they're probably getting that question way more than ESG, even though that gets covered so much in the media. I think the, the younger clients and even the older ones now want something crypto and the ETF is their preferred wrapper. So I do think they could wait for a couple months just to make sure it's not like a totally broken product because they don't want to get like blamed if it's on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. I, I think the product will be fine. I just think they want to see maybe a couple months rolling. Um, the mutual fund that Profens put out has rolled fine. There's only been about a 90 basis point spread between Bitcoin spot and the, ET, the mutual fund in about three months. That's better than I thought it would be. Uh, that said, this is a whole new game where there's all this new money. I still think it'll be maybe five, seven percent a year. That's my my guess. Um, so yeah, I think to your point, um, these RIAs, but by the way, the RIAs that you're referring to, if you take all advisors, it's 25 trillion. So if, if they put say 5%, you know, one to 5% into uh, Bitcoin, and let's say half of that ends up in ETFs, that's probably close to a, like what, a trillion dollars. Absolutely. That's and how I'm much money they manage. But yeah, I wanted to ask, I mean, obviously there's a huge advantage to ETFs from the RIA perspective. They can buy it on behalf of their clients. Clients don't have to, you know, make exchange accounts. For the crypto community that was a little critical of the ETF launch and they said, well, it doesn't track Bitcoin well enough. It's not a good investment. What's your response to that crowd? Sure. Uh, I think that there's two questions there. Um, definitely we've been asked about tracking error and I think that's, uh, you know, one of the questions you're asking here. And number two, a very big question of, I know how to buy Bitcoin. Why would I buy the ETF? Um, and I think that that's a really valid question and I don't think it is for everybody. Um, but when we do look at these larger pools of wealth that need 
a traditional market vehicle in order to make that allocation, and especially when it comes to retirement funds. Um, and as Eric talked about earlier, the tax advantages of an ETF for these types of advisors. And that's just the advisor set, um, capital you know, A for advisor. But uh, if you look at other pools of wealth, from sovereign wealth funds to pensions to insurance, um, there's immense pools of wealth that also have been waiting for a traditional market vehicle. So Casey, I'd say that it may not be um, the penultimate retail vehicle. Um, definitely if you're very comfortable with crypto, unless you love crypto so much and you are excited for the opportunity for your 401k or IRA to be able to allocate there as well, especially in a fairly tax advantaged way. Um, but I would say what we're looking at and you know, interested in is the platforms, the IBDs, um, yes, the RAAs, um, and a lot of our competitors have brilliant channels and, and know very well how to speak to those RAAs, both small and mid-sized. Um, across the country, it's very interesting. Um, but then again, some of the larger ones, what are endowments going to do? You know, Yale and Harvard have been invested in Bitcoin for a while, but would they be more interested in the ETF wrapper? You know, it will be interesting to see all the different large market participants that are just simply comfortable with this vehicle and have been and, and have been waiting for it. Um, the question is just when will they jump in? How will they jump in? Will they, to Eric's point, be pressured to jump in? Or will they make that decision themselves? Um, as for your question about the tracking error, we're not concerned about our tracking error, um, but we're also in October, to Eric's point. So, and we're trading a penny, you know, spread. So we're, we're feeling pretty good, but that is a good question. And it's especially a good question to Eric's earlier comments about 40 Act versus 33 Act. Um, and maybe he could even shed light, but it is more difficult with a 40 Act product. It is easier with even a Bitcoin Futures 33 Act. Um, and much easier, obviously, with a spot, right? Uh, it's, it's a great question and it, the tracking error will exist. The question is, you know, how much is it negligible in the grand scheme of things? Um, and, you know, we are feeling confident that we can keep the tracking error very low. But, you know, it maybe, maybe if Eric wants to comment on that, he, he knows quite a lot about this. Um, yeah, I, the tracking error and the roll cost is just the con. I mean, you've got to look at pros and cons. And I think um, Matt Hogan, who is very articulate, he was on Nate Geraci's podcast, ETF Prime, and he, he put it this way, asked, you know, why don't I just go to, and he said, look, advisors are very busy. They just don't have time to go to these exchanges, set up the accounts, rebalance. ETFs fit perfect in their system. They're like just easy button. The other point he made was, so that's why the ETF would be used instead of direct. Although if you're a single retail, a direct probably better if you're buying and holding. I, there's no denying that. The other thing was he said that um, the roll costs, if you'd wait and then the, the Bitcoin ETF, say, is up 90%, Bitcoin's up 100%. Well, you just missed 90%. <laughs> so, so I mean, yeah, the 10%, by the way, the roll cost will be, the roll cost will be correlated to the return of Bitcoin. It'll be worse when Bitcoin's on fire. So it'll be less, I think, painful if it's, you're up 100% versus 110 or 120. And when it goes down, you actually might outperform Bitcoin because you will be then rolling into months where it's less. So in a way, you're almost like a low vol version of Bitcoin in a weird way because you're not going to catch all the upside, but you won't catch all the downside either. Reminds me of a low vol ETF, although not that low vol. But that's, that's one way to look at it. But I think um, those would be the two points that I would add to what Leah's saying. You know, that, that's very interesting, Casey, maybe a pushback that's going to get me in trouble with, with our community. Oh, that's my favorite kind of comment. <laughs> I, it's, I, it's my favorite too, as the Williamsburg issuer that you guys have pointed me today. Um, <laughs> I love it. Um, it's very expensive to custody and handle Bitcoin as well. If you are a very massive bag holder, um, custody for crypto right now is extraordinarily expensive, sometimes up to 45 bips. Um, and then you look at what brokerages charge uh, and the various different fees that are charged from transaction costs to withdrawal fees to uh, X, Y, Z. You know, obviously, I definitely have my cold card, shout out to NVK and a couple other different hardware wallets. But, um, you know, I'm definitely no whale if I wanted to keep on, you know, a custodian or even the amount of hardware wallets that I keep 
just simply because it's actually necessary not just to have one, but multiple if they break, right? So it, a lot of costs do actually add up when you're even keeping your own coins. So I, I would, you know, actually caution and say it's not cheap um, to just buy and hold Bitcoin if you're trying to keep it securely. Um, you know, obviously we do know the adage and, and I also live by it of not your keys, not your coins when it comes to exchanges, especially. Um, and I think that, again, if you're if you are taking it the next step and you're being safe, it's not always cheap. Um, it is for many people. Shout out to protocol devs out there, um, you know, but uh, definitely a learning curve and uh, knowledge is is money, um, time and money. So. Um, so I, I don't know. Just thinking out loud. <laughs> definitely, definitely. This will be the first time that the retail trader, in particular, has options ability on Bitcoin. That's going to be exciting. I mean, call. We've already seen some of the call options that have been bought um, and with been popular, and then the put options. You can now make a, a, a short bet on Bitcoin without actually shorting it, because we all know how dangerous that can be. But you can just do a put option now, which is sort of like a less uh, dangerous way to short something. So that's, I think, indisputable. I think the debatable part is the medium to long term holders, which we, I think, we exhausted. So, but I would want to add that. What you're saying is there's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a fun time for the Robin Hood retail traders. I would think so. I would think that yeah. call options on Bitcoin would be like right up their alley. I mean, am I wrong? Well, <laughs> I mean, I think you're right. Yeah, look, look, <laughs> I think you're just, right. Just, all we need is we need one more stimmy check. And Val, BTS will be like a billion yeah, exactly, dollars. Exactly, Eric. Exactly. <laughs> I, I have a question. When do you guys actually think that we get the spot ETF? Is this like 12 months away, six months away? Where, 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 what's it looking like here? I, I just don't know. Um, we had clear. We had much more clarity on this run. You know, we had we said 75% chance they'll approve it. Here's the date. Here's the issuer. Um, we got all right. I won't, not not. Gonna take a victory. Yeah, I will say you guys, you, you guys kind of nailed it. that, Eric. Yeah, you can take that victory. You can take no, no, that I won't victory. Do it. I won't do it. I won't do it. Okay, <laughs> but I don't have anything close to that for the spot. I, I'm much more in the fog, like everybody else. If I was Vegas and you forced me to make a line right now, I'd probably pick December 2022 as my opening over under on spot approval. All right, Leah, over to you. Over under December 2022. Um, I think that it will be sooner than then, but I think that Eric will be able to make great predictions before that happens with some, some again, some hinting and some guidance coming from the commission when we're getting a little closer. Um, also, Eric was brilliant at being able to pick up all the different signs from issuers that things are getting closer, whether it's filing certain registration statements, et cetera. Um, he definitely nailed ours. Um, so I, I, I am not sure. I know that everybody's very excited and waiting for spot and we have how many issuers right now, um, for spot ETF quite a lot. I saw your, your, uh, chart today with 40, but that's, I know, including future ones as well. Listen, the Kentucky Derby has 20 horses. There's <laughs> literally two Kentucky Derbies. There's yeah. the futures one, which is almost like the, Correct. I don't know, the opening act. Yeah. The yep. real one is coming and that's got 20 as we speak. Yeah. So that's 40. I would imagine another 10 futures get filed by Thanksgiving. We're going to be in the 50. I, I feel like I just spent eight years tracking this, and I feel like I just crossed the finish line as a follower. And I'm like, no, no, it's just this is the starting line. I'm like, oh, my God. I, I... Eric, you having fun? You have, you, are you having fun with this, Eric? <laughs> no, it's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Eric's tweets were like, our entire Blockwork Slack channel and covering this were just Eric tweets. Everybody, <laughs> so look, you gotta understand, like, like, uh, you know, we're writing about like value and growth. I know we gotta wrap this up kind of soon. I have one more prediction to ask you guys, which is, uh, all right, Eric gave the over under uh, November December twenty twenty two. Leah said a little bit earlier. Uh, right now, GLD has about fifty six billion AUM. When do you guys think a Bitcoin spot ETF? gets more assets under management than GLD? It's a tough question on so many levels, and I, I'm sorry I'm not skirting it. But, you know, I can't not think about Safedine's, you know, the Bitcoin standard and start thinking about just the economics and evolution of money uh, when we're talking about the flippening of Bitcoin and gold. Um, you know, I know we are talking about a product here, but at the same time, I think that that does come down to the behavioral economics of uh, the psyche of, 
is Bitcoin really a better store of value than gold? I don't think we're there yet. Um, now, I think that the mentality of, you know, gold bugs has always been, and, and for the most part, still kind of always, I think, will be, um, of gravitating towards GLD, obviously not for the volatility, which a lot gravitate towards our industry, but for looking for that inflation hedge and looking for that store of value principles. Um, so I would caution on when that would be, even if GBTC is able to go through the very difficult process of um, turning into a ETF. Definitely not easy. Um, there's a lot of steps involved there. But uh, I would say that we have a little bit more evolution to do as an industry. I think that we're still a nascent asset class that is seen in a collectible stage. Um, you know, if you start looking at VJ's type of papers, you know, we very much are still transitioning. I don't think everybody sees us as a store of value. I think the volatility is still there. So we're still competing with the attention of speculators as well as long-term investors. Um, and I think until that really does change the narrative, then I think we really will truly be competing with the larger pools of wealth that have invested in not just GLD, uh, but gold as well, physical. Um, and that is many, many countries around the world. So I think that I don't have a great answer, maybe 2023. It'd be tough. I think we have a, I think we do have a ways to go. I know your question is GLD specifically in an ETF wrapper. So that's a little, that is tough um, because we could just get massive inflows and uh, speculators abound. Um, and the inclusion of, you know, GBTC, if it was able to uh, you know, reverse merge into an ETF, um, that's 40 billion, I believe that at least Grayscale has AUM, I'm not sure GBTC at current date. Um, so that is a lot of money. But I do think that we need a, a, a flippening of Bitcoin being seen as that better store of value. Um, so I think we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with all that. <laughs> um, I guess I'll get a little more specific and say, I don't know, maybe two years after the first spot ETF launches. Yeah. So I think that... Um, would you say 50 billion is about 50 billion? 56 billion, yeah. A, a billion isn't what it used to be. You know, ETFs take in 50 billion a month. So if, if you just get like 5% <clears throat> of that, you could, it would take a year or two. The other thing is Bitcoin is so, it can, it can go on these runs where the assets would grow just by the performance. And if gold's flat, you could have it happening faster. Because remember, GBTC has, what, 25 billion? But it only took in 7 billion in flows. The rest is just the market going up which is why that product is so genius. You get 2% on 7 billion, but in a bull market, that's been a very good product for them. So if that converts, um, I, I don't know if the SEC would allow that to convert before the spot, I doubt it. The question is, if they are comfortable with spot, would they let GBTC convert the same day as the first launch, or maybe make them wait a little bit since they did it this alternative way? I don't know, but uh, I know that they're not, they probably can't convert again until Gensler gets comfortable with 30 Act. And if that converted, yeah, it would be a, it would be an instant player and force to be reckoned with. But um, when that will happen, I don't know. Um, but the only thing that would, I think, create a longer timeline is if Bitcoin enters some severe bear market. Remember, ETF flows for stuff that isn't like cheap beta, that goes in rain or shine. But like the other stuff tends to see flows when it's doing well. So I think that's a big variable here. Now, will retail just move in and out of inverse? By the way, inverse, um, in your opinion, will the SEC be okay with that because it isn't, quote, leveraged? I can't comment. <laughs> See, that was the question I told you at the beginning that she wouldn't be able to answer. But I won't bring it up here about the 1.25. Did you see the guy who responded with the Zoolander? What is this, I leverage love for it. ants? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So some people were like, that's not enough. And the SEC is like, whoa, you're crazy. So that's the, where we're at here with the whole situation. So I feel for you guys. Can't please everybody. I have, I have one, I know we're past time. I have one question that I need to ask Leah, which is just how do you acquire the Bitcoin? Like, do you go trade it? Do you go, do you have like a Coinbase Pro account? Like, do you have, do you have a bunch of OTC traders who go, who go acquire that Bitcoin? Like, how does that happen behind the scenes? So it's a great question. It's the same in, in similar ways to our futures. And it's very specific to bringing this conversation full circle to what Eric and I were talking about regarding that plumbing utilizing what's called an authorized participant, that acronym we threw around called AP, 
utilizing, again, um, different participants. So I'm actually going to obnoxiously throw this to Eric, um, who does have more experience and can maybe I'll, I'll one up, make it difficult for him of just if you think that, you know, a spot Bitcoin ETF would be any different than any other ETF ecosystems. But if you want to talk about the plumbing behind how it works. No, I, the, the best way I, I've sort of used a retail store. If you're managing a store that sold, sold shirts, that's what a market maker does, right? So people want, say, BTF, and they come in, they keep asking for it, and you're selling it. At some point, in a market maker's case, they need to go get more BTF, right? And they do that to stay flat. So your one share, it's possible the market maker has somebody over here who wants to sell, or the exchange just matches you. That's called a natural. So somebody could sell you one share, and that would require no buying of Bitcoin because somebody wanted to sell the ETF share. You have to think of the ETF as a receipt. And so you are now own a receipt to a bunch of Bitcoin sitting somewhere in a proverbial vault. So you could trade that receipt with somebody and then there's no pressure on the vault. But let's say, I don't know, 20 Jasons who are very wealthy start wanting BTF and there's no sellers. The market maker is gonna have to just go get more. I won't make it more confusing than that, but they would have to work with the AP to hand in spot Bitcoin and get more shares of BTF, or in this case, the spot ETF. If a bunch of little investors all do what you do, Jason, that will ultimately lead to creations because the market makers are just like a retail store. They need to, re, they need to go get more supply from the wholesalers. I would almost argue the AP is somewhat like a wholesaler working with the sort of, you know, the issuer who can create new shares. And there you go. And so also if a bunch of Jason start buying, the price of the BTF might go above spot and somebody could arb that. And in order to arb that, you'd have to buy spot and sell the ETF. So therefore that's another pressure to buy spot. But again, it would have to be the grassroots overwhelming the market maker and the market with buy orders, which is probably what happened to Beto on the first day. They had a billion dollars in volume and they saw 570 million in flows. So, that's how that would work, but not all, and not every order was a flow, obviously. So, Eric, I mean, so Jason, just just bringing it back. Um, so that was great, Eric. I appreciate that. So you're really dividing the primary market and the secondary market. All ETFs, for the most part, work the same. Um, Eric brought up at the beginning of this call, though, you know what will happen between cash creates and in kind, and that'll be the big question: who can come in and is comfortable with the in kind. Um, and I think that, you know, these are going to start to be seen, but the plumbing behind how an ETF works is very specific and will need to be the same um, as our products come out, as our current product exists, but also with the spot. Um, the question is just also, I think, around cash creation versus in-kind. Leah and Eric, this has been awesome. Eric, keep tweeting. We love it. You make our... Uh our learning channel in the Blockwork Slack nearly every day. Leah, keep crushing it. Five years from now, you won't be the Williamsburg of uh, ETFs. Uh, so. Oh, yeah. No, she, no, she's moving to the suburbs for sure. Oh, yeah. She's going to have a gated house. Yeah. 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 You're going, you're going full Greenwich on us. Full Rye, Rye, New York, or whatever's nice up there. Yeah. Sounds great. Jason and Casey, thanks so much for having me on. Eric, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you, guys. This was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Cool. All right. Talk to you guys soon.